Hello and welcome. In the last lesson, you learned about the Swift UI button and how to handle user interaction. Well, in order to change the data and then reflect that change in the UI, we have to learn about state properties. And that's what this lesson is all about. But before we dive in, in case you're new here, my name is Chris and welcome to Code with Chris, the place to be if you want to learn how to make an app. Here's a fun fact. I discovered coding when I was in grade 12 and I was about 16 years old. How about for you? When did you discover coding? Let me know by leaving a quick comment below. And if you wouldn't mind, please give this video a thumbs up. It really, really helps out. Thank you so much. With that said, let's dive right in. All right, so I want to revisit that view update lifecycle diagram for just a second. Do you remember when we showed a link from the data to the view code? Well, let's go ahead and do that with our war card game project. So what sort of data do we have in this project? Well, if you take a look at the user interface here, you can see that we need to keep track of which card the player has, which card the CPU has, and then also the scores of the player and the CPU. So that's four pieces of data. Let's create four properties in our content view structure to represent those uh, four pieces of data. So right underneath the opening curly bracket of content view, I'm going to go ahead and declare var uh, CPU. Let's do player first, player card equals, and um, I'll just mimic the cards that we have there. So we're going to have card two. And well, actually, let me just, I'll change it. We can put something else to start. And then CPU card equals um, let's say card nine. And then let's represent the player score. And this is going to be an integer. Uh, let's start with zero as well. CPU score equals zero. All right, so now we have these four properties representing the state of the game. These four properties are our source of truth because it represents how the UI should look. Now, how do we reflect these pieces of data in our user interface? Well, we need to reference these properties inside our view code. Remember that these properties being declared in the scope of this structure means that it's available to be referenced in any of the methods in the same structure, as well as in this block of code for our computed body property. So if we look down here for this first card, that is right here. And we have hard coded a string in there saying card two. Instead of hard coding a string there, let's put a dynamic value by specifying our player card property. So let's uh, update our automatic preview just to make sure that that runs and everything's good. And you can see that that card changes to card five because that is what the value of player card property is. Let's do the same thing for the CPU card. Instead of hard coding card three here, let's put the CPU card property. Can okay, you see that change? And down here for the score, instead of um, a string of zero, let's put our uh, player score property. Now you're going to notice an error here. It says no exact matches in call to initializer. And that's because for initializing a text instance, we need to pass in a piece of string data. But player score, remember, this is an int property, so it contains int data. But how we can get around this is we can turn our int into a string. Uh, well, at least the string representation of a number. So the way we can do that is we can create a new string instance and just pass in the, um, we can pass in the integer. So this one would be player score. And we're going to do the same thing for CPU score. We're going to create a new string and we're going to pass in um, the CPU score. And just like that, we have our four pieces of data being represented in the view code and in turn in the UI. Now, all we have to do is when the user taps on the button, we can update this data in the properties and have the UI automatically change, right? 
Well, not so fast. Why don't we go ahead and try and do that and let's take a look at what happens. So in the last lesson, we had changed uh, this deal image into an actual button. Right now, that action closure is empty. Let's put some code inside this action closure for our button. Here we are going to update the cards and we're also going to update the score. Now, if you try to update the property like here, let's try to update player card equals card 11. You'll see that you can't. Xcode will complain and say, cannot assign to property, self is immutable. Now self refers to the instance of a content view and immutable means that it can't be changed. You see instances are value types and because of the way that they are allocated in memory, they can be changed. Now I know that makes absolutely no sense to you right now, but I promise you in a future lesson, we will talk about that and then it will make complete sense. For now, just understand that we can't change the value of our property unless we use a property wrapper. A property wrapper is a keyword in front of our property declaration that changes its behavior. Now specifically, I'm talking about the state property wrapper. So let's go ahead back up to our property declarations and see how we can use this state property wrapper to change the behaviors of these properties so that we can change the values. All we have to do is in front of the var keyword of our property declaration, we are going to write at state. And by adding that keyword at state, that is going to indicate that that player card property is actually a state property and it's going to allow us to uh, update the value in it. So let's go ahead and put this property wrapper in front of all four of our properties so that they are all state properties. State properties have two special characteristics. Number one is that you can change the data in them. We've already talked about that. But number two is that inside the view code, any references to state properties, it, they will get notified of the data changes and then your UI will update automatically based on that new data. So let's go ahead, go down to the action closure of our button and try to update some of these state properties and let's watch the UI change. Okay, so here we are. And as you can see now, the error is gone. And I can put CPU card equals card 12. And let's go ahead and update the score as well. Might as well just do that. So I'm going to say player score plus equals one. That means to increment it by one. CPU score plus equals one as well. And we'll save this and then let's go ahead and do a live preview. See if we could do that. All right. So this is a live preview. When I tap on this button, it's going to run the closure here. Wasn't that cool? So when I tapped on that button, we updated the data in the state properties, right? And because in our view code, it references those state properties they got notified and the UI was re-rendered to show the new data. Now the problem is that every time we tap on the button, I mean, it's incrementing the score, which is cool, but the player cards aren't being randomized. So what we can do is we can use the random method of the instruct to generate a random number. And then we are going to append that random number to the back of the card string. Uh, to generate a new card. So let's take a look at how that would work. Generate a random number between 2 and 13. Because if you look at the asset library, we have card 2 all the way to card 14, actually. So I would probably want to generate from 2 to 14. So I'm going to say uh, let player rand equals uh, int dot random and this method allows us to specify a range you can specify a range with uh, the lower end of the range dot 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 
and then the upper end. And it should be inclusive, if I remember correctly. And we'll see in a second. And let's declare another one. CPU rand equals int dot random in two dot 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 14. And then what we're going to do is instead of specifying the number inside the hard coded string, I'm just going to specify card. And then I am going to add player rand, right? And add CPU rand. Now, we might not be able to do this. And as expected, we can't because as you know, from earlier in this lesson, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to uh, append a integer to a string. And what we have to do instead is convert that integer to a string first, get the string representation of that integer. And there, um, this should be dynamic now. So let's take a look at this and see if it's what we expect. This is perfect. The cards are randomizing. What's not perfect is the score down here. We still need to determine which side wins and then increment the appropriate score. So I am going to comment out these two pieces of code because we don't want to just be incrementing it by one each time. Now, before we end off this lesson, I really want to point out and stress how powerful this framework is. What we're doing here is tapping a button. It's running this closure and we are changing the value in this state property. And because the state property is being referenced inside of our view code here, it is detecting that data change and then re-rendering what we see in the UI. And that happens automatically. All we are doing is changing the data. In the past with UIKit, this system didn't exist. What we would have to do instead is update the data just like we're doing here, but we would also have to update each view element manually and tell it what to display. So what we'd have to do is get a reference to this image and then uh, generate an image from this asset name from the asset library and then set that image asset to this image view. And we'd have to do that for this one as well. And then we'd have to do it uh, for the text here and the labels. So everything we had to do manually. Now, all we have to do is update the data and any pieces of UI tied to those state properties will detect the change and update automatically. Now, by definition, a state property is a piece of data that this content view depends on. It's not something that other views would care about or depend on. And so by that nature, we can add the keyword private and just control the access level to these pieces of data so that they are only accessible within the context or the scope of this content view structure, since it's only this content view that depends on these state properties. All right, we're almost at the finishing line. We just have to compare the card values and then update the score state properties appropriately. Let's do a quick recap now. You learned how to reference properties in your view code. You learned about the state property wrapper. We also learned about some new terminology, including hard-coded values, dynamic values, and immutable, meaning that it can't be changed. Now remember, you can get access to all of these quizzes and challenges and extra resources if you go to codewithchris.com and either sign into your account or hit the try for free button at the top and then enroll in the 14-day beginner challenge. Lastly, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for the next lesson. In the next lesson, we're going to go over conditionals and how to compare values using if statements. All right, I'll see you there.